Hey guys, today I'm going to show you how I built a plankton net, how I collected the plankton from the ocean, and what that plankton looks like under the microscope. The first thing I did was make a paper model of the plankton net so I could get all the dimensions figured out. The net itself is made of woven nylon. I decided to go with 25 micron because I think that's going to capture a pretty good range of plankton. It's going to miss some of the really small nanoplankton, but those aren't going to be very interesting under the microscope anyway. I scaled the measurements of the paper model to get the dimensions of the net. Then I glued the seam with E6000, and when I was gluing the seam, I laid a layer of wax paper underneath the seam to prevent the E6000 from sticking to other parts of the net. The E6000 did a really good job of gluing the net together. It didn't damage the plastic and it stuck really well because it's a woven mesh. I made a test piece just to see how strong it was and it was a really strong bond. I'm pulling about as hard as I can here and I'm not able to break it. I found a bucket that would fit the opening at the top of the net. I cut off the bottom and roughed up the sides with some sandpaper to help the E6000 stick better. I also made this test piece and it's plenty strong, especially in the direction that the force is going to be applied to it. I attached a sample collection bottle with a hose clamp and a piece of silicone tubing between the hose clamp and the net. The next step is to collect some plankton. Now if you're near a pier, you can just drop the net off the pier attached to a rope and drag it through the water that way without getting wet but there wasn't a good pier for me to do that nearby, so I just went out into the ocean and dragged the net through the water for a few minutes. Okay, so this is what the uh, collected plankton looks like. It's also a bunch of uh, just silt and sand that got through, uh, but I'll let it settle out and we'll get a better look at it and then put it under the microscope. So starting with the biggest organisms that I caught, this is an amphipod. Amphipods are crustaceans, just like shrimp and crabs. This guy was about a quarter inch long. Most amphipods are scavengers, and you can see this guy is actually collecting the plankton and bringing it to his mouth parts. I concentrated the sample by centrifugation, so there's only a thin layer of water. That's why the amphipod's not able to swim very well here. I believe this fuzzy worm is the larva of a polychaete worm. Polychaetes include bristle worms and fire worms, and you can see it has those fine hairs on the sides, which is characteristic of polychaetes. He's also partially immobilized by the thin film, but you can see here he has cilia on his front and back, and he's using the cilia to suck up some water. I think that's maybe a rotifer he's saying hi to. And those three-pronged brown plankton are dinoflagellates. He just ate a dinoflagellate. So this creature that looks like a tiny jellyfish, I believe is actually a hydrozoan, which is related to jellyfish. Both jellyfish and hydrozoans have a free-swimming form that looks like this. It's called a medusa. The most well-known hydrozoan is the Portuguese man-of-war. This here is a copepod. There's tens of thousands of species of copepods with all different body shapes. You can really start seeing the scale of the plankton in the sample from the amphipods to the worms 
to the copepods, and even the nanoplankton. I believe this is a rotifer. Rotifers are much more common in freshwater environments, but marine rotifers do exist. We're able to visualize its internal structure really well, even though it's largely transparent, because I'm using phase contrast microscopy. Phase contrast microscopy works by converting the phase shifts of light as it passes through mediums like the transparent body of the rotifer into differences in light intensity. And just a lower magnification of the sample. Here's another type of zooplankton and a rotifer. It's really amazing how complicated their internal structure is and how fine the details are. More zooplankton feeding on the diatoms and dinoflagellates here. And a few different types of copepods. You can see they all have different strategies for moving around. Diatoms and dinoflagellates make up the majority of the phytoplankton in the ocean. Phytoplankton are those photosynthetic plankton that make up the base of the marine food web. Diatoms are the most common phytoplankton, and they're responsible for generating 20 to 50 percent of the Earth's oxygen. This sample actually had much fewer diatoms and more dinoflagellates than I was expecting. Diatoms have a hard shell called a frustule, which is made of silica. That's the major component of glass and sand. Diatoms mostly don't move on their own, they're just carried by the currents. Sometimes they're solitary and sometimes they can form colonies. They also have a huge diversity of shapes and some of them are really beautiful. Here's a few diatoms. I believe these are in the genus Isthmia. Here's another diatom. This one's a Coscinodiscus. It's shaped like a hockey puck and we're viewing it from the face. You can see as I pull the focus, the features become more visible. Like I said, this sample has a lot of dinoflagellates. They're the three-pronged ones in the center here, and also that larger circular one at the top left. Dinoflagellates are mostly photosynthetic, though some are mixotrophic, meaning they're both photosynthetic and heterotrophic, which is when they get energy from eating foods. And as the name suggests, they have flagella, which are little tails they use to propel themselves with. And you can see that on some of them if you look closely. Dinoflagellates are really interesting, and they probably deserve their own video. When conditions are right because the water is warm or there's a lot of available nutrients, they have a population explosion called a bloom. You've probably seen the glowing blue waves. That bioluminescence is caused by a type of dinoflagellate. Dinoflagellate blooms can also be quite dangerous. For example, some dinoflagellates produce paralytic and neurotoxic compounds that can be taken up by shellfish like mussels and oysters, and those can be dangerous if they're eaten. Other species of dinoflagellates can produce large quantities of ammonium, which reduce the dissolved oxygen in the water, leading to mass death of fish and invertebrates. Other species of dinoflagellates can produce surfactants that destroy the waterproof coating on the outside of seabirds' feathers, and that causes them to become waterlogged and die. Anyway, I hope this video inspires you to make your own plankton net, or buy a microscope, or just go down to the ocean at low tide and look under some rocks. Thanks for watching.